Greetings, everyone. My name is Ahmed Negron Perez, and I would like to welcome you to the webinar, Active Shooter Situation, Describing Unique Challenges Involved in Preparing for, Responding to, and Recovering from a School-Based or Post-Secondary Institution Shooting. This webinar is hosted by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students in collaboration with the Readiness and Emergency Management for School. Assistance Center. Now I would like to turn it over to my colleagues from the REMS TA Center. Todd? Thank you, Ahmed. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Our, our call today is so that only our presenters can speak to the group. However, we will be taking questions from the audience. To ask a question, simply type and submit your questions at any time you, during the webinar using the online Q&A chat function on your screen. The submitted questions are only visible to the webinar hosts and presenters. Please note that you will not be able to see the questions other participants are asking. Presenters will present and respond during the Q&A session at the end of the training in the order they are received and you will see a file share pod that contains a downloadable PDF webinar slides. Please click on the file name and then click on the Download File button to save the webinar slides to your computer. Today, we are joined by two presenters from two of our federal partners. Ms. Catherine White is a former state prosecutor and is currently a supervisory special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. She is part of the White House Working Group that authored the guides for developing emergency operation plans and currently coordinates active shooter for the FBI. Our second presenter, Mr. Calvin Hodnett, serves as a senior management analyst for the Department of Justice, Office of Community Policing Services. Calvin was also part of the Working Group for developing the guides. He has extensive special project experience and is currently responsible for developing training and technical assistance for school-based law enforcement nationwide. Prior to joining the COPS office, he held positions with the public safety at the State University of New York and at Northeastern University. Catherine, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start things off uh, for this uh, presentation and, and first of all thank uh, the Department of Education for inviting the FBI to participate in this. Uh, we think it's an incredibly valuable opportunity to bridge the gap between those in the school and the first responders who need to be there on scene when something occurs. What we want to accomplish today will go through but I want you to keep in mind that everything that we talk about needs needs to be said um, in the context of developing the guides and, and school planning. As you know, schools serve 65 million students, and you, many of you are responsible for students and the faculty and the staff, the parents involved in, uh, in educational efforts in the United States. Weird, and we're aware uh, in law enforcement that, that situations do occur. We're going to try to provide to you uh, a little bit of information on how often they occur, where they occur, um, and the types of things that you need to be considering when you think about a shooting in a school. Certainly it's in the news today. So we're on the same page. Uh, they are areas that involve a typical criminal activity. It derives its name from the circumstances that surround the act, where one or more engaged in, in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined area. We'll talk about that definition definition as we go. The FBI as the uh, as the initial uh, speaker mentioned, has been part of the White House Working Group developing these guides. We developed them with the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA particularly, Health and Human Services and Education. And I would urge everyone listening to take the 
time, go through the language in the plan in those because the language was debated word for word for inclusion in the guides because we wanted to ensure that we were speaking, though we speak in our agencies sometimes in different languages, we, we made sure that the language had the same common, uh, whether it was from, from the initial uh, prevention all the way through to response and recovery. We've looked for new strategies for law enforcement, things that we won't uh, get into in great extent today, but we wanted you to be aware that though you are doing things in schools, law enforcement has done a number of things that, that also it requires them to think uh, about these new strategies. So, so as you go through the steps in the planning guide, uh, there are, uh, again, everything stays in the framework of steps in the planning process and the active shooter situation is no different. Um, I just made a couple of notes here for you um, to think about, for instance, in one, you definitely, as you form your collaborative planning team, we are going to talk about threat assessment teams. Well, who can in your collaborative planning team that can help create, help pull together the right people for a threat assessment team? And in addition to that, that assessment team is going to have to be put together in step four, as, as noted here. And the same way in step two, when you assess and, and plan for the risk that you might have in your school for active shooters, we recommend the school's plan for the possibility, not the probability, of an active shooter situation. Because I'll try to talk to you a little, try to give you a little bit of information about uh, how common this, uh, these shootings are. But just like a, a fire may never occur in your school, you still have to plan for the possibility. In the same way. As you get to six, when you're talking about um, training and exercises, you, we recognize that just like in a fire drill, just like in uh, an evacuation drill, uh, hurricane preparedness and concerns in the school, trained based on the age of the students, the based on the age of the people in the building, the types of people you have in your facility, whether it's an open campus, a closed campus, make sure younger that you include parents because, again, something that's different that we think shooters is it is new. It's a newer subject. And even though uh, Columbine was years ago, tech was years ago, and the events since, it's still something that many, many people, we hear in law enforcement all the time, happen in my school. This will never happen in my school. And then school people, uh, the people in the schools, the parents who are interviewed uh, are on the media environment saying, I never thought this would happen in my school. I never thought this would happen in my, my school. You have to include the parents because it's a language change and that training and the exercise that has to occur in that step, step six must include discussion and awareness because it is a new and and in certain ways to understand what it involves and how to talk about it. So today we're going to focus on four things. Why you need a plan, what is an active shooter event, and who is an active shooter. Third, how assessment teams can help to avoid a catastrophe. And in that part, I'd like to tell you a little bit, if we have time, as we go about the steps that are being taken to prepare law um, and, uh, and also other first responders. And then finally, what to do if it happens, what to expect from uh, first responders and law enforcement. So first, let's just talk about why you even need a plan. Because 
schools actually are much safer than they are than they than they ha than they ever have been in the last 20 years. A Bureau of Justice statistics research showed just released in July. Because if schools are safer, we maybe we don't need that. Well, schools are safer. The the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, also provided some some uh, research in our own. Uh, FBI Academy's behavioral um, analysis unit, the people that uh, sometimes are referred to as profilers, we obviously work closely with them. They're part of our team. And our, uh, so if you hear me say BAU, that's what I'm talking about. The analysis unit, although I'll try not to use the acronym. We do know that these numbers are going down. And why are they going down? Uh, they're going down because the schools have stronger violence prevention programs. And that overall makes schools safer that there are much better mental health services available to uh, in people in the schools. So move to switch, switch group, uh, slides here and say, so some people say to us, hey, well, yeah, but there are a lot more shootings on college campuses. Well, statistically, there aren't. that of incident has risen with the number of people in, in the universities. The enrollment has gone up in the middle and the number of incidents have gone up proportionately. It's not necessarily a question of school safety and, and that's a lot less safe, although uh, I've heard that, we've heard that a number of times at the FBI. And Bear out. So why do why do you plan? Well, the traffic in Newtown, Connecticut, um, after, right after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. It is a crushing obligation to the schools, to the fire emergency, law, the law enforcement who respond, the school administrators. There is a crushing obligation of, of, of items do need a plan for this type of event because effective planning sends everybody to the place they should be in an emergency when there will be no time to get together and sit down and discuss that. And that's one of the things that I heard uh, one of the officers say uh, recently, which I thought was really uh, solid advice, is planning, planning is never going to be bad idea. It's always going to help. And that may sound kind of um, obvious, but we, we all think we're going to plan for things in our lives, and we don't really all have those plans. Um, so it's important because it, it is a crushing, crushing obligation. And, and the trap and egress with regard to the Sandy Hook shooting, for instance, uh, was completely congested by parents and emergency service vehicles, made it very, very difficult to get to the school, uh, and very difficult for uh, first responders to get away from the school uh, to take people out to hospitals and, uh, and to respond back to their own offices. 
Um, this is a picture of, of at Virginia Tech. So it's not, it's not a new event. It's definitely a concern. Why a plan? Because the media attention and the way that you deal with victims, the way that you deal with families is going to tell of how you are viewed as successfully dealing with this uh, a tra tragedy, tragedy like this. So what is an active shooter incident? Active shooter, by definition, a definition given to, uh, to by Department of Homeland Security that all federal agencies concur with, is a individual actively engaged in killing, attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area. And as we know, unfortunately, schools are part of those situations. You may also hear, and in your planning process, also speak to others who talk about mass killings. So I wanted to address that here just so you're aware. In 2012, Congress passed the Investigative Assistance to Violent Crimes Act. The President signed that in January of 2013. And it defines by federal statute killing. So a mass killing can be three or more killings in a single incident. So as you know, a mass killing may not be an active shooter situation. An active shooter situation may not be a mass killing. So the terms are interchangeable. Um, and you may hear, hear people. Um, and we have heard people say, oh, well, you guys are talking about different things, or the statistics don't bear that out. Well, statistics, which we'll talk about next, um, depend on the research that was done and the term that they used. All of law enforcement uses the same terminology, uh, state, local, campus, tribal law enforcement officers, and departments that are working with use terminology uh, and the same definition that the FBI uses as because we gather the data and release the data uh, annual on annual events or our um, our individual offices gather the data law enforcement relies on the same terminology that we use so if you hear a term these just so you're aware these are different terms but we are using all the same language and as we work with all the departments we work through these so while the language in the guide says mass killings or active shooter, it means exactly what these definitions are. And we would encourage you to ensure that you use the same kind of terminology uh, if your active shooter uh, portion of your plan. So an active shooter incident, an active shooter event, those are events that, um, those are incidents in law enforcement, there hasn't been a ton of separate and segregated research on. So I'm providing you some research here so that you, you can see uh, how we interpret it and what, what we uh, are concerned about. And I want you to also be aware that the items that we talk about, the items we rely on for the materials that we place in the guides and the materials that you see here today based on lessons learned and best practices developed over uh, our participation in responding to these events. 98% of these, um, these incidents are state or local in nature in terms of who has the priority jurisdiction, which is a you know, for law enforcement, who's going to be the lead agency on the scene. But the FBI, because of the forces that we bring to the table, it is, has been, uh, unfortunately, I guess fortunately,
best practices talk in after action reports about what could have been done better, what lessons were learned. So every time an incident occurs, we're able to gather that up that we share with law enforcement. So, so there hasn't been a lot of research done on specifically active shooters. However, there was a there is a team at Texas State University led by Pete Blake and and his research on 84 active shooter events from 2000 to 2010 was just released uh, in July. We, we had access to that prior to uh, July when we were working with our working group from the White House, and that helped to guide us in what we thought were priorities that we needed, for instance. And as you'll know, 34% of those incidents, of those 84 incidents, occurred in schools. So our concern was that schools are as, as, as big of a concern as any other public uh, location, and we wanted to make sure that schools were taken care of and were part of this planning process. The incidents that you might uh, be aware of from the past few years that we gathered these uh, best practices, of course, included the uh, the senator, the congressman shooting in Tucson, Arizona, the movie theater shooting in Colorado, which occurred uh, overnight at, at, at uh, basically at about midnight in Colorado, and involved uh, spraying of weapon uh, a weapon spring that, that crossed into two theaters in the Aurora, Colorado movie theater situation. And so many people injured, uh, a very, very hectic scene, uh, including the Sikh Temple shooting in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, uh, August, where uh, there were several, uh, both seven people killed within, uh, within the building and outside on the, in, on the grounds of the building, and many uh, others injured. And of course, the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting that you're all familiar with, where 27 uh, people were killed, including the uh, 26 at the school and the victims uh, and the subject's mother, uh, who was killed off-site. So who does this? Who is an active shooter? We took this question, and we've been uh, back and forth with our uh, behavioral unit personnel and others in the federal government who do this type of research, private, in, private uh, that do this kind of research. Who does this and how can we prevent it? Because that's really the most important thing. If you can prevent it um, as part of your planning, that's the, best, that's the best solution. So you need to know what are you trying to prevent and who are you trying to get to? Well, we definitely know there's no profile. Uh, our teachers are in the school are primarily male, but not all male. Um, a high percentage are male in the 90s. 90% 90 are male, but not they're not all male. They're all age ranges uh, from teen years up into uh, much higher in the 60s and even 70 year olds. So there's definitely not a profile of somebody who fits into this or fits into that, but we do know uh, that many of these attackers felt victimized. They, they, there's a victimization element to things, um, and that's where you want to look as your threat assessment team is built, your threat assessment team, if you develop one in your school system, uh, or if your state statute requires it, if you're in a university, uh, your threat assessment look to some of these factors to decide, hmm, you know, is this guy a threat and how can we mitigate that threat? The one uh, reason that I put this information up here about um, John Nicoletti's research on 35 active just in the past year is, set, is the last statistic. 74% of the attackers entered through the main 
main entrance. As you may know, the Sandy Hook shooter in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, entered through the front door and the front door was locked. And that school did drills for and plans for shooting events. So we're not saying you can prevent it, but we're saying you can try to prevent it through uh, looking for the opportunities through a threat assessment team to assess and bring somebody, uh, somebody who is it at down from the threat of, of, of causing uh, harm. But we're also saying the better you plan, we know statistically now the better you plan, the less die. John Nicoletti uh, is a researcher who and he police executive forum uh, commonly referred to as the police executive research forum. He presented these statistics in February, and we discussed them. Um, and again, with the attackers walking into the location, this is I'm, with the attackers walking right into the location. It, it is a definite risk. You have to recognize it's going to happen, and these people are going to. And I recognize now I've got two. Stats. The slide before says 74% enter through the main entrance, and this, this one says 71%. So, the front door. This this one is is physically walked in. So, in a couple of cases, they walked in from a side door. So I just wanted to differentiate so that you didn't think I was um, throwing numbers out there that, didn't, that, that weren't consistent. But it, where, where you have these attackers and they're coming in, another thing that, that we saw from John Nicoletti research that we think is very important for you to recognize is that the average active shooter event is over with 12 minutes. So 12 minutes, law enforcement's not going to be there. Well, they could be there, but in very few instances, law enforcement is there percentage-wise before the uh, shooting. So your school is the first line of defense, and they need to be mentally prepared for that. 63% of the attacks that occurred last year were 15 minutes. 37% in under five minutes. Because these shooters come in and their adrenaline is so high, they fire very quickly, many, many rounds. And we do know from, uh, again, uh, lessons learned and best practices that when they enter the scene, they begin shooting, that oftentimes, although we don't have the statistics on this, but we have anecdotal information that when law enforcement shows up and the shooter hears sirens, sees lights, or sees a police officer, the shooter often turns away from their, who, the victims that they are seeking to attack. Sometimes they commit suicide, uh, though not all the time. Many instances they engage uh, with law enforcement before the threat is ended. Oh wow, this slide looks scary. We're going to fix that for you. Uh, put this out permanently. But um, what we wanted you to see here is the continuum of what happens with an attacker. So if you can between the lines, the, continu the, the continuum starts based on our uh, information from our behavioral uh, experts. They explain it this way, that the individual is somehow feels, the shooter somehow feels a grievance. They feel that they are victims. And 
in the ideation part of their analysis where they determine, hey, I'm a victim of something, something that's gone wrong, and I want to make sure that um, I'm going to be I'm going to be made whole because of whatever occurred to me. As they go through their thought process, on um, this is what we refer to as the ideation and the research and planning, they're going through the process of converting their mindset from I'm I am being victimized here. I am the victim. They they want to engage their world in a control they want to not just be the victims and the way that they do that is they begin to research and plan how they can take control of their bad situation and as they do research and planning uh, for their um, their injury it is during that time when they do things that are that we know people see and people hear. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. That research and planning time, their preparation time, they need before they enter a scene with weapons and bulletproof vests on and magazines loaded with bullets. They have to have done planning and research and preparation and those things are things that we know people uh, know about and and here and we want to make sure that those things are things that are brought victimized people may this continuum where they move into preparation and then they they attack we want them to back up and 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 go back down that hill into I have been aggrieved however I'm going to resolve it in the way that is acceptable in in society and of course that that methodology uh, for accepting that in society doesn't ha have anything to do with taking a gun and shooting people. So when we talk about what motivates somebody to actually, uh, as they say, pull the trigger, the, the trigger, that last step where they move into this last step that's on the scary slide that moves into attack mode, when they're moving into attack mode, we see triggers. Our behavioral analysis experts see triggers that motivate people to do things. And many of these are so common, and um, I, I know that you, you may say to yourself, as you look at them, oh, those are all obvious. But we want to bring those to your attention because they, even though they may all be obvious, sometimes you don't put them all together. And you want to make sure that you put them all together and you, do, you don't disregard and you recognize that an individual may have lost a job or his spouse or her spouse may have lost a job or a child may have been kicked out of school in another area and those kinds of things trigger um, an effect. Uh, an individual who is a, teen, a teenager in high school, his friend is kicked out of school so he didn't lose his uh, school privileges but his friend did. Those are triggers and the, we would urge the school at Stratus assessment to look at what those triggers can be. We know that many of our uh, active shooters were described as social isolators. Uh, some had reported contact with mental health professionals, but please don't uh, interpret from that that these individuals have mental health issues. Some may have mental health issues, and some have statistics. Some may have uh, a history of mental health but it does not mean that they have mental health problems. Uh, we hear that sometimes people say, well, only a crazy person does this. And, and from a medical standpoint, uh, though the FBI, uh, I'm not a doctor, um, the, uh, from a medical standpoint, the 
not a question of whether they're crazy or not. It's not just crazy people that do this. Um, and as you can see, very few have previous arrest for violent crimes. So this is a, something where there's a motivation that triggers something, and then it, um, what things can we can can the can a threat assessment team look for? Uh, most importantly, the threat assessment team is going to look for behavioral indicators. Though there's no specific profile. Are, are, are items that behavioral analysis experts say, look to these behaviors and, and see whether or not they're observable. Many times they are. I think probably as we work through this, one of the most uh, common um, Um, those statistics vary. Uh, studies show that all these uh, all studies that have been done on active shooters they vary somewhat because it's a, it's kind of a new statistical analysis segment. However, they do know that at approximately 80% of school shootings, at least one person had information that the attacker was thinking about or planning a school shooting. And many people are surprised when they hear that, but we know from our behavioral, uh, the work that our victim um, assistants do and the work that our behavioral analysis people do uh, nationally, that p people know, people hear, and there may, there's a reason they may not say a teenager may be worried about retaliation. A sibling may be worried about uh, responding and being the one who, who, who gave his brother or sister up. But the bottom line is that 80 to 90 percent of these schools know that one or more people had information about them. So that's a culture that um, there are different, different, different parts of this educational effort to talk about changing the culture and the climate in your school. We would urge that culture and, cli culture and climate discussion to talk about dealing with the active shooter and encouraging, just as we encourage people to report bullying we, and to report drug uh, activity in their schools, you develop that culture that also encourages students to uh, make sure that they Talk to people if they hear something. In the world, see something, say something. Avenue. Uh, the behavioral indicators that we've identified uh, and are on these next two slides, just so you're aware, uh, we they talk about contextually inappropriate behavioral activities. So contextually inappropriate a recent acquisition of weapons. We take no position and, and are not saying that people should or should not have weapons. If you grew up in weapons in your, with weapons in your house because kids are hunters and the kids have guns in, in their bedrooms, in locked cabinets, it's not that there's an access to weapons. It's contextually inappropriate or recent activity that is different. So that's an escalation in targets, in training, in a obsession with explosives, an obsession with movies, and the types of things that, uh, that encourage this. YouTube videos where they change their behavior and we see an escalation of their concern. Um, so I talk a little bit about threat assessment teams. Um, we get asked this a lot at the FBI, what, what is a threat assessment team? How can a threat assessment help to avoid uh, catastrophes? And, uh, and probably it, it is one of the most things, most, most beneficial things that you can do in whatever tool you develop, develop some sort of tool to identify, evaluate, and address any, uh, any troubling signs. It helps you to um, plan and prepare 
and move forward with a group of people who are going to look at all the things that come to them, and they're going to look at them with the same set of eyes, and they're also going to pick up individual pieces of information, and, and, and they're going to have a better understanding of, hey, what does that mean? And they also will have the resources to go back and weigh that information across from other, uh, across the, the broad spectrum of what may be the school or the university may be dealing with on a daily basis. Um, the, the, I wanted to mention here uh, so that if you don't know, you should know, the Department of Ed has a uh, resource repository that I believe is also available on the REM site. tracking tools that other universities, that other departments of education, state school, uh, uh, school districts have, have offered to the Department of Education. They have placed it on this resource repository. I mention it here because there are some and there will continue to be uh, materials that are provided on the resource repository for threat assessment teams, how to set them up, who should they, what should they include. I recall I was on there just the other day, the uh, Virginia, Fairfax, Virginia County School System has a uh, procedure threat assessments that is posted on um, and, and actually has a checklist for people who are interviewing uh, uh, students that come to them with a concern. So there are materials out there, it's not an overwhelming concern. Your team needs, your threat assessment team needs to be uh, multidisciplinary. It, it, we very strongly encourage that it include mental health professionals and administrators, uh, educational professionals, and law enforcement. Uh, they can provide this holistic threat management services service, and that the law enforcement uh, can bring to the table. Uh, perhaps their uh, your school resource officer. Perhaps they are law enforcement attached to the school system, and perhaps they're your local law enforcement um, department and, and a member of that department. They're going to be able to provide that holistic threat management, and we'd like to see that um, because that's, that's been the most successful model so far. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you'll notice on the last note here, um, the FBI's behavioral analysis experts are available 24-7, 365 days a year. They participate actively in threat assessments to develop threat mitigation strategies for persons of concern. Uh, we are uh, available to, uh, by reaching out to your law enforcement or to your uh, local FBI office, of which there are 56 FBI offices in the United States, and, uh, and in addition to that, uh, hundreds of 450 about other uh, regional offices in addition to the main offices that are out in the, without the, throughout the United States. Those behavioral analysis experts are available to you, um, so please reach out to your law enforcement, please reach out to your FBI offices uh, when you have a, a person of concern. They, they have done an excellent job of helping to make sure that um, when a school has somebody of concern, they come up with mitigation strategies. So our activities at the FBI um, and, and through with law enforcement are not all, always about putting somebody in jail, I hope you know. They are absolutely are about preventing something from occurring. Uh, just so you are aware, uh, what is law enforcement doing? We're working on best practices and lessons learned, and we're working actively to ensure that our, uh, we share that without, uh, through tabletop topics, exercise, training, tactical training for law enforcement to keep them safer. We know that uh, law enforcement is a, at a high risk when they go into these situations because uh, we're training them and they know that they must go into the scene, sometimes a single officer, uh, to mitigate the threat. And they, that's exactly what they'll do, but it is a threat that, that is a danger. Um, I'm pretty sure that that is not. So finally, I want to talk about what do you do when it happens? What can you expect from law enforcement? Um, 
these plans uh, that include courses of action to respond to an active shooter, as I mentioned earlier, active shooter events um, is not something that maybe a lot of schools have, have done a lot of planning for that course of action. And so um, this is going to be new, and it's going to require some conversation, and it's going to require some planning, and it's going to require some discussions. We need you to teach and train on these practices. Please engage local law enforcement, fire, uh, EMS, the emergency, the first responders who come to the scene, uh, they know what they're doing and what their roles are. You need to know what those roles are too. Train your staff, uh, most importantly because law enforcement won't be there when it first occurs, please train your staff to overcome denial and to respond immediately. We know statistically, we know from research that denial makes for delay. We don't want that to happen. They all know that they have options, just like in a fire drill. Everybody gets up and walks out of the building. The last item I'm going to talk about today is uh, run, hide, and fight. What do you do when it happens? Run, hide, and fight. This is a mantra that uh, we're sticking to now. Um, and we think that this is a simple way to uh, remember what your options are. We, we ask you to teach this. We've discussed it at the federal level extensively, uh, the pros and the cons. Uh, we've heard some criticisms about uh, the methodology, and, and, and we welcome uh, conversations about it. We want to be able to explain why uh, we came to this uh, conclusion that run, hide, and fight is the continuum course of action that we recommend. Um, and running. Uh, is something that you need to do to teach your personnel to move uh, out of the building, out of the area, say, to a safe place, as far away as they need to, and then they need to, they need to be trained to contact law enforcement. In cold weather and in fr below freezing weather, it could be to forests, and it could be uh, to, uh, to homes nearby. You have to look at your individual circumstances and come up with a plan, but we would encourage everyone to begin with running, hiding, and fighting. Start in, that, in the continuum. Just like we teach children to stop, drop, and roll, and everybody learns that as a young, young age, stop, drop, and roll, uh, that's what we want to do here. Run, hide, and fight is a simple, easy to remember mantra that says, hey, get out of the building and, and move on. Because for our, from our perspective, people building, the faster we're going to be able to get to the shooter and the faster we're going to be able to get to, um, to the victims and, and get them to, to uh, safety and so, or to, to hospital. So when you want to leave the building, remember these types of things. This is the same. Run, hide, and fight is the, uh, is the same thing that you may see on the Internet. It's a, it's a system that a suggested uh, course of action that was developed by the city of Houston on a DHS grant. Um, the concept of running is get out of the building. There's a video that goes with this. It's available for free. All the resources on Run, Hide, Fight are available on the city of Houston website. They're available on our, our website um, and, and uh, the FBI's website. And we would want to make sure that you teach your people, leave the building. Yes, we understand it's a new course of action you have to develop. But we want people to recognize that you can't have people run out of the building and line up where they line up for a fire drill. It just it can't happen. And so, yes, running is, is, is hard to discuss, but so is people shooting at you. And it's a conversation that has to occur. As far as hiding, um, we recognize there are going to be situations where evacuation isn't possible. In the Newtown shooting, the shooter uh, entered the building from the front door and fired at uh, students and people in the front office area, in the front hallway lobby, and in the first three, uh, first three classrooms um, in the school, right around the corner from the entrance. So there were a number of school uh, children in a number of other classrooms, and maybe their best situation is to lock down and maybe not. If you have the opportunity to, to run, if 
you go. But if you don't have the opportunity to run and you need to hide, the school needs to come up with the, the system that works best for them, but we definitely encourage these different things. You must find a sheltered area if possible. Remember that cinder block walls, bullets don't go through, but bullets do go through uh, walls that are, uh, that are thin and um, internal plasterboard walls. You want doors locked, you want barricaded doors. The research that we've the research that has been done on the Virginia Tech shooting and other shootings shows that where the doors were locked, where people were not able to um, come up with a way to, where the shooter was not able to come up with an easy way to get into the building, he moved on. These shooters are coming in with a lot of adrenaline, so they're going to shoot to the fastest places they can shoot to the easiest places they can shoot. And if the door is locked and they push on it and you're pushing back on the other side, that shooter is not going to push through. Uh, generally, he's not going to be able to get through. And, um, and those are the things that you need to talk to all of your personnel about. Turn off the lights, silence cell phones, lie on the floor, remain silent. Uh, same, in the same way, this is a conversation that's not easy to have, but you need to have it ahead of time. Um, you, if you can't run and you can't hide, then fight. And, some people uh, say, oh, well, you know, I'll lay on the floor and play dead. Well, you know, yes, you can do that, but we know now from research, and it's not easy to acknowledge, but we know now that shooters will shoot at, at an inactive body just as quickly as they will shoot at an active body. So people who, um, if the shooter doesn't have anybody to shoot at who's run, he's likely to shoot at the person who's laying on the floor and put more bullets in them. So you, you may be able to hide and you may be able to play dead, but you may not be. And so instead of giving up, we, we know you need to have this conversation with your personnel. And I would say this, the Newtown parents, uh, we've had several conversations with the parents involved in the Newtown tragedy. And they, they are supportive of this. I don't mean to speak for all of them as a whole, but I will tell you the ones that we spoke to said, I want people to do, I want people in, who are entrusting with my children to do everything they can do. And that, if that includes fighting, then they need to fight. And there are on the internet, uh, through various sites, many ideas of kinds of objects in your environment you may not even think about that you can use. And, and there must be a commitment to do that. And in order to have that commitment, you have to have your head in the game. You have to be able to think. Um, so we're going to have, um, we're going to be on scene, and we're going to move fast to the scene, and we're going to go to the shooter. And, and I, your personnel need to understand that. Um, we've talked to police chiefs who said, we trained our people to walk over injured bodies who were screaming at them and asking for help. And unfortunately, that's exactly what our officers had to do. And it was very difficult for the officers, but they were trained in it and they recognized that that's what they needed to do. We encourage you also to participate in tabletop exercises and please spend time with law enforcement and, and first, other first responders so you can each understand what your requirements are. Because the time is where it is, I don't wanna uh, spend too much time on this, but just so that you know, um, you'll be able to see how uh, first responders uh, move into an area and they will work towards, um, they, 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 just like you will, they set up outside uh, at a location, they'll set up an incident command or a unified command where all of the different agencies that are principal agencies will be involved. It's important that the school administrators from the school be there and represented within the uh, incident command, not as part of incident command, but to be uh, as a liaison to incident command to understand what their needs are, to provide them access to school um, data, uh, school records, school individuals, uh, to, to overcome things that sometimes cause unfortunate and unnecessary stumbling blocks such as, as BERPA. Uh, we've listed uh, some of the FBI resources uh, as we work through uh, what we can provide to the public uh, to bridge that gap between 
uh, prevention and preparation and into response, the law enforcement's response. We're going to try to provide uh, and continue to provide those things to the, uh, on the FBI's active shooter pages. Uh, again, this presentation is available, so you'll be able to get these websites. Uh, the presentation itself will be available on the, in the REMS TA Center site. So I'm going to stop here and turn to Calvin, um, who has not had an opportunity to say a word, and ask Calvin, uh, what did I leave out, Calvin? Um, I think you did very well on it. I think we can move to the questions if you want, and then um, that will probably fill in any of the blanks that we could have been missing. I'm in. Yes. Um, actually, we have a couple of questions from our participants. Unarmed security guards uh, regarding active shooters, uh, basically asking how can we slow down the shooter, divert him away or her away from students. Well, that's definitely a two-part question. One, obviously, uh, there is training for unarmed security guards around the country. I think you can contact your local police department about that kind of training. They can help you with that. Or you can contact your local FBI field office. I'm sure they will point you in the right direction also. Uh, the second part of it, how can you slow down the shooter or divert him or her away from students? Um, most likely, if, if you follow the rules, remember, everybody knows the rules. The rules say that you can't, right now the rules say you kind of hide and you kind of lock down into your classroom, and the people know that. So part of the run-high fight is saying, let's do something a little different, and let's, let's kind of mix it up a little bit and make sure that things happen the way the shooter has planned for it to happen. If people are near doors, Exit out the door, exit your classroom out of the door, and then go to a designated rally point outside the school. And these sort of things can maybe uh, take the uh, shooter off uh, balance. We can go to the next one. Excellent. Um, following question, um, who should be involved with the planning process for a school EOP, as far as we're talking about you know, creating this EOP or maybe revising it? Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, the guys really lay out the fact that we are literally looking for a multifaceted and collaborative effort. I think one of the challenges of a school-wide EOP is not bringing enough people to the table. You should bring people from the school environment and from the district itself, but you also should bring law enforcement, area law enforcement, even a wider section if you have a sheriff or something else like that who may possibly be responding. But also, you really should also look into bringing community members in, your local psychological uh, agency, your local um, uh, victims advocates or anything like that also may want to play a part in what's going on. The, the other part, of which makes it a bigger thing about the EOP, is that it's about emergency operations as a whole. So you also may want to talk to your local emergency managers also to have them involved. While they may not be involved directly in all the conversations, definitely you want everyone as possible to be knowledgeable about the fact that you have a plan and that you're working on a plan. And Kelvin, if I could add two more. Sure. One, um, when in our conversations with Department of Ed, one of the things that they stressed is that your team needs to be big enough that no one feels they're saddled with this huge responsibility. But your team needs to be small enough that you can have quick, agile conversations and make progress happen. So, and one of the, one of the things that I think you should um, r remind everybody of as you bring teams together is that if you're assigned to work on active shooters and that is your part of the plan or you're assigned to work on some other course of action as part of the plan or some annex, you're not alone in that because there are tremendous resources that are available uh, through uh, DHS and FEMA, through the FBI, through Department of Justice, through other agencies, and as I mentioned with the resource repository. So though you may, you may be able to get a person on your team who's responsible for a particular item, they're the responsi responsible party for that particular item, but they're not alone in developing it. Excellent. Um, I, I do have a question that I'll probably fend, and if you guys want to add in some comments afterwards. The question is revolving around templates available for possibly a district trying to come up with their own emergency plan. Um, basically, the U.S. Department of Education and, and our federal partners, when they sat down and, and came up with the guides, 
was thinking about that and about not necessarily using a template to sort of fill in, but to actually have the local school districts or, you know, the local schools actually walk through the process of using the guide. So the guides per se are not just a, a framework, it's actual process that you walk through and going through the steps that are found in there will help you actually come up with a high quality uh, school emergency operations plan. Um, so we are in the works of possibly coming up with maybe an evaluation tool uh, so you could take a plan that you already have and maybe run it through the guide or through this tool to see how it stands up and compares to what we suggest is uh, should be included in a high quality uh, EOP. But um, as far as that template thing, we really want you to have your customized, your needs addressed uh, at your local area. Um, Calvin and, and Kate, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's a good point. That sounds good. Moving on, we have very good question. Um, what protocols exist for 911 centers in advising school officials on actions to take, if any? Um, the, I, I can just uh, snag that one, uh, Calvin, and just no let problem. you know, there are not standardized protocols, so every 911 center is going to have its own protocols, and this is something that law enforcement is aware of, and at the federal, uh, at, at the uh, national level, um, IACP, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police uh, and other organizations are considering these concerns because we do have situations, for example, in, um, in the Sikh Temple shooting in Milwaukee, uh, 911 was overwhelmed um, by media calls and it made it, it made it impossible for them to uh, reach out and, and transfer the call to media and it made it impossible for them to take calls for a brief uh, period of time. And we can't afford that. But there are no standardized protocols, although that's on our list of things that we hope to help um, encourage law enforcement to uh, push out. Excellent. Um, I think we have maybe time for a couple more questions. Um, I'd like to ask this one now. Oh. Um, would you, could you possibly talk a little bit more about if there's research or if the research says as far as um, related to students in elementary school as far as that relates to run, hide, and fight? So I guess specifically run, hide, and fight sort of research specifically for elementary school. There is not research for that because um, you, I think the caller is getting to the uh, questioner is in the, in the people online are, are questioning, do we want to run, hide, and fight when we're talking about uh, first graders and we're talking about kindergartners? And we recognize uh, and we had extensive discussions in as part of our working group uh, with Department of Ed uh, personnel and others about whether that is still a good idea. And, and we still do continue to endorse the run, hide, and fight. I think that it has to go to all the way down to the elementary school. You have to have uh, that as an option because that may be the best option. And if the best option is for kindergartners and first graders to flee the back of the building, they need to know, and their, their teachers and those who have to keep them safe need to know that that is their first option. But there is no research on it. The research on, on run, hide, and fight, the research on active shooters is just, um, it's kind of just. Great. All right. Um, I think that's basically the time we have. Uh, really good question. And, uh, Can I slide one more? Uh, Oh, you sure can. That's why I was going to lead to. Okay. <laughs> and um, so that leaves the floor open now to Kate to, uh, I know she wanted to add some extra information. Uh, take it away, Kate. Uh, actually, I wanted to uh, mention one thing about, uh, we do get this question in law enforcement all the time about, uh, it's kind of like when uh, you go into a school as a, as, a, as a law enforcement officer and the kids ask you, uh, you know, do you, do you shoot them in the leg? Um, and the answer is that truthfully, no, we, you know, we are not, trained, law enforcement is not trained to injure somebody, if you have somebody who is threatening other people's lives. So we have had, and I saw one of the questions about, well, what about non-lethal methods? Is there, is there a way to train um, uh, the people in the schools to go after the attacker, um, but in a non-lethal way? And I know that law enforcement is trained to go into the fight, but everybody else is trained to go away from the fight. But 
if we're going to train people in the schools, I think you have to recognize the shooters are not coming in to harm people. Uh, they're coming in to kill people. And, and it sounds uh, frightening, and we don't mean to frighten people, and I wouldn't say it that way to a kindergartner or a second grader or a fourth grader, but the adults in the crowd should know that these shooters are coming in to kill as many people as they can. So the training shouldn't focus on non-lethal methods. The training should focus on ending the threat. That's a very good clarification. Um, uh, I think, Calvin, oh, go ahead. Calvin, could you also address the uh, funding? Uh, oh, absolutely. That was the last thing I was going to bring yeah, up. I get asked that all the time. Uh, everybody is always interested in the, what the funding issues are. Obviously, we're going to have a funding this year uh, post-Newtown for SROs um, through the COPS office, but uh, we anticipate in the coming years to also have regular funding for more uh, sworn law enforcement officers in schools, but also we are uh, anticipation of a comprehensive school safety program that would include equipment, uh, possibly psychologists, and uh, the funding of school site assessments uh, for districts and individual schools around the country. So look forward to that. That's actually good information, really good. Um, well, um, hand this over to our REMCA Center because I think this is uh, the time we have available. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, Catherine and Calvin, for your assistance today. We hope you found the information provided today useful and you leave with a better understanding of how the new guides in developing high-quality emergency operations plans can support the development of er emergency operation plans that include preparing for, responding to, and recovering from an active shooter situation. If you would like to listen to this webinar again or share it with others, the archived webinar and other supporting documents will be available on the REMS TA Center website at http colon backslash backslash rems.ed.gov under the webinar section of the site in approximately 10 days. In addition, we invite you to visit the REMS TA Center website anytime for additional resources, publications, and trainings to help you in your school emergency management planning efforts.